starting the meeting recording Tuesday October 17th for the OSE dev team okay working document is in there so notes uh, we've got Lex taking the notes and uh, continuing here so let me share my screen okay there's my screen people so <clears throat> so take a look at this this is our latest progress here uh, as far as the development team numbers we're hovering at uh, around 150 160 development hours per week so about four full-time equivalent if you call it that taking a 40-hour week being a a full-time effort on one one person uh, so that is decent definitely working on building a team Connie is in the background she, we're we're recruiting I mean we want to build up a an HR generalist person that can constantly funnel new developers and subject matter experts into the program so that's um, that's where we where we are on that uh, otherwise no new developers for this week but uh, Jermaine is going to be returning uh, he had to take a leave for like a month or so, but he's going to be returning back. And the way I w I'm going to structure the new developers from now on is we, we want to write out uh, like a 12-week plan where we have a certain deliverable or a, like a main goal that a, each individual can can take responsibility for as an owner in some way of a, of a concrete goal. And instead of everybody going through uh, kind of like following along with everything that's going on uh, do more of ownership of, of a particular project so that's happening in some part right now things like you know Lex doing some of the the platform for development and other people focused on specific tasks like Michael on the server uh, or like for example Christian was doing the ISO and things like that so moving along uh let's see if uh so, so well so let's go through the main outcomes of the week the main thing was the cnc torch table last week so that workshop was quite good uh this is the final product we got so we've got um we've gotten to the point of motion we mounted everything we had the axes moving and the z-axis using the manual z control um, pretty good I mean it looks looks pretty impressive we finished up the bed it's actually ready to be filled with water for water cutting for water cooling of the workpiece uh, so we kinda refurbished everything there we got so far as um, yeah like the motion so what you're seeing there on the on the y-axis which are the shorter axes we've got double belts so two of the six millimeter belts um, we found that the resistance on the carriage itself, the force needed to move it, is between 10 and 22 pounds. So we're using the, the bushings, the brass bushings. Resistance is significant, like say take nominally about 20 pounds. And what we have in the system here is four NEMA 17 motors driving it, which when you do the calculations on the pulley size, that should be getting us 60 pounds of force on the short axis which is the which carries the both the uh, both the short axis which is Y and the long axis the X axis so that's that's the heavy axis the X axis the long axis has no problem moving uh, we on that we have two stepper motors but the, the thing that we cannot figure out is um, the math says we've got 60 pounds of force on the available from the motors and we've got 20 pounds of resistance and it was moving but in places it was skipping so uh, at present the the issues the next step is I still feel that it appears that the math I mean we gotta shake down understand what's going on because if we've got 60 pounds of force and we've got 20 pounds of resistance the axis should not be skipping and we measured the 20 pounds basically by putting a scale and pressing with a scale and reading the the measurement off the scale uh, so we were reading like 22 pounds for the amount of force to move the the y-axis uh, and on the x-axis it was smaller probably about 10 pounds 
or so. But we got to shake down what's going on. Is it the incorrect settings and a stepper driver? Uh, the trickiness, there is a little bit of trickiness on that. And that when you use the TB6600 drivers, you have to set both current as well as micro stepping setting. And they don't just work like one works with like one micro stepping setting works with any current. You have to have both of them correct, both the current correct and the micro stepping correct. And the combination has to be correct. Uh, since there are three levers to set, that's a lot of com possible combinations. But the documentation on the, I couldn't really tell which was like on and off for those little setting switches on the TB6600 so that's that's the point we got to I, I still think that uh, with the proper current settings we're gonna be good here now if not we're gonna go to a larger larger stepper motor like do uh, probably from here unless this is working just go to oversize it go to like NEMA 34 and get uh, much more force than we have right now uh, we have used 425 inch ounce motors on the original version of the torch table. So here, while we have a total of 280 from 280 inch ounce from the four steppers, a single NEMA 34 that we used before had 425. So that's like you know, 1.5 times as much for a single and probably three times as much for two of those motors if we do one on each side. So going to a bigger motor is definitely going to solve it. Um, but yeah, I wish we were cutting right now. We're not. And uh, which means that that affects the, the strategy going forward on a, on, a, on a tractor, which essentially we have, we pretty much had made two years ago. That was what, 2014 or so. Uh, or 20, 2014, so three years, th almost three years ago. Now, we made the other tractor. So we have all those tracks intact. In fact, we have a set of tracks that we haven't even used from the last build. So we can use those tracks that we have, which are exactly uh, like drawn out in the pictures in our, in our CAD. So we can reuse the tracks and actually make it easier on ourselves to build the whole tractor. So I think that's, that's what we're going to do right now. Um, with about 10 days left to the event, that's that's what we can do right now, un unless we're cutting ourselves. We can potentially outsource that to still to a metal shop, but I mean, if we have the tracks that are available already, that means dismounting the tracks from the older tractors and cleaning them up, as opposed to starting cutting afresh. So, we'll, next steps are to make this work, uh, make the CNC torch table work. Now before the 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 workshop unless somebody qualified can actually help on that like full time we're we're not going to get that torch table for the workshop um right now the priority is to finish up the cad do all the work on all the missing all the details on the tractor the micro tractor and the tractor so that's the current state um we are still planning on so so once again the power cube the solar power cube is in the works that's all good we've got the solar panel we've got the um, gps automation part matt droder is working on in the background on that uh, we've got a team meeting on that at 8 p.m tonight with he brought in a few people from the robotic operating system project ross project um on that on that team and then we still are planning on the gasifier, meaning a um, next iteration of the, the gasifier work that we did before. So simply putting in a, uh, doing a, a small gasifier for the micro tractor, feeding that into the, the gas intake, the air intake of the, of our engines, the Duromax engines, which is quite easy. I looked at that. We need to basically uh, bolt on a, an air inlet pipe going from the gasifier to the to the tractor so so that's still looking pretty exciting as far as all the different versions the solar the charcoal as well as automated versions uh, looking good um, let's see and Roberto so on a micro track Roberto did a lot of work on the on the actual geometry of the loaders so that's looking quite good on page uh, page number six 
Uh, looks like, I mean, as far as, the, as I'm concerned, that geometry is working. And this is what we're going to look at, just basically now source the correct cylinders and make it happen and, and see if there's any discrepancies. Uh, Roberto, can you maybe talk a little bit? Did you actually, the, the cylinders that you draw in, are those that you drew in, are those actual specs of surplus center or did you just make up a, a length that worked here? No, I, I, I used the same uh, specific specifications of the, the cylinders of the surplus center. Excellent. And, and I'm seeing that hole far back there, like uh, if you see my cursor there, yes. the hole back there, that's the actual mount point? Yes. Yeah. So if we hide this, look at that. That's that's where it's at. Looking good. So those appear to be... What are those? Are those like 18-inch cylinders or something? Um, they are... Um, when, when they are retracted, they... They have uh, 22 um, point 20, 25 inches. Uh huh. When retracted. And stroke, stroke is 12 inches. Stroke is 12 inches. Wow. Okay. <clears throat> That's good. They look, uh, they look, I guess, longer than 12 inches. But I get, let me uh, get a tape measure out there. Um, you can measure it with the reset arms uh-huh yeah no that's right I mean it's 18 inch body yeah it's about a 12 inch cylinder and that's gonna get us so upon dumping the bucket uh, what angle are we gonna do get to with the raised arms is that in the picture too is that actually drawn out in there no uh, the file is, is another another file okay yeah. it's in my log okay um, now, this one that you see me here, is that the actual race geometry, or is it different? Yeah, it is. Okay. Yeah, that would, that would um, pretty much work. Um, I'm looking at that, my only question is, when we have that cylinder there, that bucket is pulling hard on that cylinder that we have there. It could work. There's um, basically, like, when you, when you have it in a lowered position, in the raised arm position, that angle is rather small, but it looks like it will still have the forces. And you went through some of the forces and you got, you actually got the force at that lowered position? Yes, um, uh, I sent you which, a, a, yeah. an email. Yeah, you sent me an email, it was something like 400 pounds or so, if I recall, 500 pounds? Uh, I forget. Yeah, yeah. yeah five, five, 544 uh -huh. for yep. vertical push uh, and for vertical pull is 302 in the lowered position yeah w when the cylinder right. is fully extended yep 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 and that's okay because at that point the point is to be able to dump it so it's actually dumping by gravity so we actually don't even need any force to dump it and then when we retract it, if it's like 300 pounds, well, uh, that 300 or so pounds has to be sufficient to pull the weight of the bucket. And 300 pounds is probably okay. Um, it's probably okay. The, it depends on the weight of the bucket. Uh, do we have any feeling for the weight of the bucket right now? No. It would be around, I would imagine... If that's a four foot wide bucket, yeah, around there, I would say uh, my guess is like 250 pounds or something or so. Yeah, yeah, no, I mean, I think this this works. We, we should try it. I mean, the idea is to try and uh, see if there, this is like the, the, f the first build of this style of tractor. So what you do is you build rapidly and test every part out and see if there are bigger issues that we're not even thinking about that are the matter. Otherwise, we can make slighter, slight corrections, like for example, we're using only a 1.5 inch cylinder, right? That's that's a 1.5 inch uh, diameter cylinder, Roberto. Is the bore? Is the bore? I mean, that's a super tiny cylinder. So if uh, if the 1.5 inch bore 
Uh, that, I mean, that's a very tiny cylinder. Think about 1.5 inches. That's not a lot. If that doesn't work, we, we can go to a larger bore cylinder. If you look at what we have there, there's plenty of room to accept a thicker cylinder. We just went with a small, tiny one. Um, yeah, and we can, in fact, it's probably, given those results that we have right now, which are like 540 pounds of push um, in a raised direction, it might be probably worthwhile to go to like 2 or 2.5 inches at this point, given those results that we have right now. So in fact, that's probably what I would do. I would really go to um, really really make sure it were sufficient and make it 2.5 inches. That's that's what I would do. And as far as the other cylinder, I believe there we were thinking about uh, a 3-inch cylinder, was it? I'm not sure. I, I don't recall what we did. But yeah, we have to size them, just go through the numbers again and get the right thickness cylinder. And it's easy to, once we have the correct geometry for the length, increasing the width as needed, the bore of the cylinder, that's not an issue. Um, that's easy because the the key is the mounting points that's the critical geometry yeah so that's looking good um, so some of the outstanding pieces there I'm seeing that there's a beginning of the track tensioning which is awesome so so basically what we said for the track tensioning we have this uh, so you have the two vertical arms here arm holders yeah no this is coming along here who did that? Was that Abe or is that Roberto as well? Yeah, me. Oh, excellent, excellent. Um, I'm I, gonna. Yeah. I had, I, I had to keep the um, the, um, the mounting plate for the motor, and I, I use just the the part that is bolted to the motor. Oh, you just did the. You now the motor is attached to the vertical. Yeah. So. Yeah. I I I think that that's the way that can be tensioned. Yeah, absolutely. No, that's that's correct. I mean, we don't need that plate on the... We had it on the outside of the tubing here before. It's perfectly fine now that if we've got that structure, the verticals there to attach to, we can attach that motor plate to the vertical. So the idea is we put uh, two tensioners, so, so something like a one-inch bolt that you crank up and down. Uh, we can probably put... Um, Given the geometry here, we can do something like maybe like a bar on top or no, even you know what what I see here we can sling a a uh, u shaped bolt around this arm or or just attach basically a threaded like a one inch threaded rod to this vertical rail assembly so that we're pulling this let's see let's click on it uh, that whole thing that's our vertical rail that slides on top of those arm holders we we just need to add a one inch rod to it somehow um, in fact I would see the easiest thing to do is to put a clamp like a clamp collar around this shaft yeah yeah clamp collar around the shaft the clamp collar has the bolt attached to it and then you're turning and then in this plate here would have two bolt holes where you can, where there's a nut on the other side, and you just pull, you just uh, turning a bolt that's like right there. Um, wait, no, you're turning a bolt that's underneath. Yeah, we have to think about that. But yeah, just a basic tensioning mechanism. We've got this space here. Uh, we can put a a threaded rod in there somewhere, one inch. One inch would be plenty. Uh, one inch has thousands of pounds. It's like fifty thousand pounds of. Uh, clamping force or so it's it's on a tens of thousands range so that's plenty um, to do right here yeah excellent uh, I'm gonna paste that in to show this detail this is an important detail that was, that's uh, I think it kind of worked out nicely because we were considering well how do you work out those tensioners and these tractors where before we had them underneath and they were somewhat hard to work with you kind of have to get down under there uh, so I like this more accessible higher on top so uh, let me paste this in here yeah excellent excellent um let's see <clears throat> who do we have do we have do we also have abe we don't have abe in today 
So, okay. That's moving right along, so we'll, we'll continue on this. Um, let's see, what else? Um, I'd like to hear just a little bit about the annotations, since, that's, since documentation is a big piece. Roberto, would you mind going through this, um, just just an overview of the annotation macro, just for everybody to hear, like, is that already available there, and, and what, what we can use that for? So, can you tell us a little bit? Um, well, I, I used that macro only once, mm -hmm. and, and I... I, I think it is um, maybe it, it could, can be useful for for just few annotations in, in the three D view, uh -huh. but not not for many many annotations because because the the difficult um, thing about about the, the the annotations is that um, mm -hmm. it's, it's difficult to to place. Uh, to move to move them. Oh, it does them automatically. No, so, oh, n not not really. You you have to enter the coordinates. Oh. Oh yeah, so it's kind of so painful. Th mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's uh, uh, really uh, difficult and it takes a lot of time. Yeah. But but for just few and few notes in the in the page, it, it can be very, it can be very useful. Okay, yeah. Okay, oh, that's definitely where where some better programming, um, better version of that, would be very useful for the team. Okay, um, yeah. Do you do you suggest like you know widespread use of that, or it's too like too painful? Uh, like I said, is if if you want to to put a lot of notes, it's going to be a, a little painful. Yeah. But yep. what is nice is is because um, in the draft workbench there 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 is also um, another tool for putting annotations. But um, the difference is that uh, with the macro annotation we can change the color of the the label. Mm -hmm. So that's nice. That, that's what I, I prefer the macro. But yeah. Yeah. Okay. Sounds like um, we're hungry for the package that Michelle is working on, I guess, because that's probably gonna have the annotation. Uh, Michelle, does your how does yours work on annotations, like putting labels on? Is there anything like that in what you're working with on the on the tool chain there? And Michelle, if you just just review for everybody, what does overall status is that for somebody who's new? To the project, let's say. Can you do that? Uh, well, the, the add on is uh, practically ready, uh, but I, uh, I have run into some issues uh, working with bigger files like the, the filament extruder. Uh -huh. I don't, there, there's something wrong with, uh, with the colors. Um, at certain uh, parts, uh, are invisible and uh, they work as a sort of a mask. They, they create like holes in the model. Um, but uh, I think it's uh, export settings of the the, the 3JS model export. I think that there's. Um, I should look into the, the color settings. Okay. I'm gonna do that this week. But for the rest, uh, it, it works great. Uh, uh huh. I tested it on the on the power cube and it, yeah. it, uh, it does the job. But with the annotations, when you hover over the, the parts, you get a label of the part you're hovering over. But you don't get like all the all the labels at once. It's only like the part you're hovering over. Okay. So you can so, explore the, the model that way. Yeah. Okay. And to back up, the idea here is so the tool chain is we take a free CAD file we then export it and then we have an import it into blender what's the export format that we import uh, into obj so we export into obj's we open that up within blender and what happens to the colors are the colors 
You said you're having trouble with that? Uh, with Pitcat 17, uh, 0.17, uh, the colors are exported. Okay. Uh, OBG is uh, um, there's also an MPL file, a material file that is, ex is exported. Uh -huh. That's new for uh, 0.17, so the colors ain't the problem. Okay. The only thing is um, for the development, uh, Roberto suggested to work with the merging. Uh -huh. um, Uh -huh. But uh, to, to use it in WebGL, um, it's necessary to make an assembly, an assembly tool or workbench. So this, that's a bit uh, of uh, But I've been looking, maybe it's, uh, it's also possible to, to automate that. To uh, make uh, a macro for, uh, for FreeCAD, that it takes all the parts and exp every part individually uh -huh. and then imports it again in, uh, into the assembly to workbench. But um, uh, that's, that's a, a whole different uh, matter. Right, so what, what happens right now when you export? Are you basically exporting a bunch of individual uh, elements? Not, not how you have it within the FreeCAD? Assembly, not not like the modules as you drew them in FreeCAD, but just like as individual faces and and sides. No, and no. Uh, the, when you export it uh, as a, so you make the assembly, uh, you use the assembly to workbench. Uh, you you put all the all the parts. That you have to save all the parts individually and then bring them back uh, into the assembly to workbench, and then you export it as an OBJ. Okay. And if you import that OBJ into Blender, yeah, uh, it, uh, it imports all the, the parts okay. with the right name. Okay. Oh, that's good. That's good. Uh, but uh, I've already talked to Roberto about uh, sort of a, a naming policy. Uh huh. Um, I'm uh, I'm gonna include that also in, into the tutorial. Yeah. Uh, how it works best if we want to uh, have a workflow that the names stay the same from development to assembly to WebGL. Yeah. Uh, we should use like a certain um, way of naming the parts. Yeah, definitely. Okay. So, so the names can stay the same and it doesn't become uh, a mess. Yeah, 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 that would be good. That's our product data management system here, yeah. Okay. And, hey, uh, Marchin. Yeah. So, one thing we can do is just maintain a spreadsheet of, like, tracking all our parts. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, you know, you would have, like, an assembly number and a part number. And a part number. So that might work before we were doing, you know, yep. 30, 30 dash numbers were a, a certain part number, 40 dash were a purchase part number, um, and then, you know, a uh, 10 dash number was a top level assembly and you might have a sub assembly that was a 20 dash or something. so mm -hmm. uh, so something like that you know you don't even need a system you just need a spreadsheet and that works pretty well so that was the idea behind the master um let's see the master what do we call it the master master part index yeah we should use that we should maybe add a, a, some of those features to our master uh, spreadsheet that's definitely a good idea um, yeah. and from that yeah and and that spreadsheet is broken down to the very tiniest detail so we should really implement that and a thing like um, is there a convention within a uh, CAD world for like you said 10 dash 20 dash or all that I no, mean is I mean, there any was, convention that or just my last work um, I'm not sure of like a standard I think it's kind of uh, company to company yeah is really where I see it so yeah you know it can be interesting um just having some sort of system that like hey yeah here's our yeah naming system let's um and just a really quick that if you find a part you're like oh that that must be an assembly so you can go searching through by you know you could search all of yeah. wiki for 10 dash mm -hmm. like that okay that's good Michelle if you can um basically build on what we've already said before regarding this topic that would be good so the thing that we have talked about is a three-letter code, like, for example, 
we were using LFX for Lyman filament extruder or like CB or PC. So two or three letter code to begin with, yeah. dash or whatever, and then go from there. But what we should do, Michel, uh, when you have a proposition for exactly the, the whole format of a part number, of a part name, bounce it to everybody so email everybody and we can let's shoot that back and forth until we agree on a on a good standard that everyone's comfortable with then we can yeah. start adapting that yeah that'll be great uh, all right but, uh, I, uh, if I understand, um, but uh, just what do you mean like with the numbering not using uh, specific names but only numbers to no name the parts? No way, no. I mean, you want that the, the name to be as useful as possible. So no, I wouldn't make it all numbers. So I would... the, the trick with that is, let's say you we make a part on the Lyman filament extruder and we want to reuse that in some other part, right? You know, somewhere else. Mm -hmm. um, if you make part number specific to the project, um, it can be a little confusing then because now you're using a Lyman filament extruder part in the micro track and, you know, uh, maybe this, like, and that's a lot of the stuff we want to do is have it like be as modular as possible, and then you can pull yeah. the motor over to another project. And so, if it's named, you know, LFX, you know, something else, then yeah. it's really confusing. Then, you know, do we rename it? Is it now a different color? So, yeah, I think having as like simple, at least from my experience, it was just like as soon as you start adding a bunch of designations, it doesn't really matter. You just need to be able to go look up like. Is this a part or is this an assembly? And then, like, just you would search in your spreadsheet. That's that's yeah. what I found to be helpful um, for the naming system. But uh, well, uh, with the with the numbering, uh, it sounds okay. But problem is, if you um, import in Blender from uh, from FreeCAD and you want to uh, use it in WebGL, the parts uh, can't begin with the with the number. Okay. Yeah. So something uh, else. Yeah. Build. So it should it should start with a with a letter combination. And I was like thinking about if it's a a, a bolt, a, a washer, or a nut. A, yeah. To, to name it B uh, B W uh, N. Eh? So you know it's a mm -hmm. it's a, uh, belongs to uh, attachments. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So we had a separate. Um, so there would be part numbers, and then there'd be purchase part numbers. Would be another kind of bin. We uh, have top level assemblies, um, and then like sub assemblies, and then we actually had a whole separate hardware component. And that those you know those got their own um, numbers, and you kind of kind of want to have a code for that. So because that's yeah useful. Of, you know, so I mean, it doesn't matter exactly what it, like form it takes. I just think something in a general idea of make it as usable as possible between all. Different projects. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 No problem. Uh, it would be nice. Just uh, tr uh, try to to uh, avoid uh, uh, starting with with numbers. If we want to use the web GL, uh, so uh, start with uh, with letter code. Yeah. Okay. So if you could maybe. So I guess the idea would be to get a whole bunch of classes, like letter classes, that co correspond to general classes of part types um, yeah 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 do that that's this is not an easy question we we, sh we should all just just uh, declare it bounce it back and forth a little bit until we we agree and yeah it's gonna be a big big deal huh like because that that could uh, affect a lot down the down the project down the line yeah yeah and I, I just think we're going we go in so many different directions with different different parts that you know, it's nice to have like smart part numbers that have something in there, but um, I mean, having a folder or, or a batch, you know, uh, I don't know if there's some way to tag it, you know, maybe a, just a modifier to say, hey, it's in this, in this project or something, but um, mm -hmm. yeah, it's, it, it's tricky. And then, then, then you have this whole issue of like metadata on top of that, right? So if you want to be able to put in other information about what project it's in or something or where you got the part from or something. That's yeah. That is a, a big headache for a lot of people managing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Once we get a get a clear a clear view on it, uh, we could make a, a parts library uh, into in FreeCAD to develop. 
we have already a parts library, but uh, we could uh, add our uh, our own parts. Yeah, I like that. Yeah. That would be nice. And it'd be cool if it was built in there. So instead of having to go, you know, export that part or save it as a FreeCAD file, it'd be nice if you could just go and say, I want to save this part to our open source ecology, you know, documentation library or something, right? And so it would just add that part to the library. So, you know, again, if you're trying to work off a USB or something, you might not even have to ever have to save something, right? You could just um, send parts back and forth over the internet. Um, just have something you know, locally, you just be it. Okay. Hey guys, I started a, a wiki page uh, detailing kind of. A, I don't know how, how soon we can have something like that built, but uh, there's already uh, What's an outline the page? kind of an, of an idea to do that. Link it. Okay. Can link for that or. Can you put a link in the chat to the wiki? Yes, one second. Okay. Um, part naming convention. I mean, okay. Uh, okay, part name, part naming convention is what we need. So, um, let's start a page called part naming, OSC part naming convention. So I linked it from there. Yeah, I mean, this is going to be like, that's a major deal. There's a page called CAD standards on the wiki as well. Let's see if that has anything uh, useful for naming there. I think we might have done something there. CAD standards. There's a CAD Standards 2012 page. Let's see, part naming, okay. Yeah, well this has just totally cryptic numbers here. No, we gotta have some better description than that. But you can also take a look at um, Okay, so I'm pasting in the OSC part naming convention page. Let's start that. And then in that, we can put a link to previous work. So create a link. That's all that we have. But yeah, obviously, I, Mike Apostle back from 2012 did, wrote some stuff there. But yeah, take a look at that CAD standards 2012 part naming. Um, not much there. So yeah, let's. Um, that's our new page, OSC part naming convention to make history happen right here so let's jot our notes and it's this is this could be a complex document so let's let's do like a first cut um, I think the idea would be to you know start start testing this because you know we can come up with an elaborate scheme but then once we start using it you can find for example that nobody wants to use it it's hard or whatever so what we got to do is uh, declare something and then start testing it uh, with a project and then see how how we can do that maybe with the since we're at the point of doing the mastercad for the let's see the mastercad on the tractor we can potentially start backfilling that in with the better names if if possible but but at at this point we want to declare it and test it as soon as we can and kind of see what sticks cuz the the thing that's throughout the project uh kind of the principle of what sticks is applicable ie like we we call some procedure and then when people actually start using it, and when it becomes a norm, then, then we can say, yes, this is actually official, as opposed to we just declare something and without testing, which wouldn't work. So that's the idea. 
Okay, so let's uh, so so Michelle, please do a first cut of that, and actually anybody, please uh, we can contribute to that page. We can collaboratively edit that. Um, but maybe Michelle, if you can own that, since you're really you're really key behind the tool chain, and a lot of the you know it's a feedback, constant feedback between the idea of the part naming, the actual tools that we're using, etc. So if Michelle, you're you're actually developing the serious tools for. Uh, a lot of the documentation that would make sense that you own this page more than others uh, given that the, the, the WebGL is uh, such an essential part mm -hmm. okay. yep so I'm gonna say even page page owner page uh, what do you call those people who on the wikis like media wiki who are responsible for a certain page they are maintainers page maintainer right page ma maintainer we'll call Michelle you've been declared page maintainer of the OSC part naming convention all right I have a question yeah uh, what about the uh, file naming convention is that related to the part naming well, yeah, absolutely. Because, Cause, yeah, I, I see it like a, a tension uh, between those things because mm -hmm. we want that parts can be used in many projects, but file name want, wants that each part is related to each project. So, mm -hmm. I, 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 I don't know how we can uh, face that issue. Yeah, well, both have to be reconciled. Um, any immediate thoughts, Michelle, on that, or? Yeah, yeah. Let's think about it. But definitely, there's the issue that we can name things, but also we end up using certain file names in actual projects. And is there any? That all has to be consistent. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, let's think about. It. Let's. Uh, that's. This is a deep question. So let's let's sit on it and, as we have some ideas, start documenting them because we can uh, definitely get into uh, a heated discussion on this here. So. Mhm. Mm okay. Uh, next, then. So let's see. Uh, Josh, do you have any any updates on um, on the trencher design? I didn't paste that in, but here, let me just paste the one image I have here. I didn't get an update. I loaded it on the wiki yet. Um, Just one background note while he's getting that <clears throat> hydronic stove. We're back to it, so you can see the welding picture. But basically, a, a two by three foot, two by two by three cubic foot structure with about uh, it's about ten or twenty. I forget about fifteen or so. It's all documented, but but we've got a heat exchanger in there, which constitutes the heating stove for the CD eco home so that's a nice thing the material cost in it is about five hundred dollars uh, compared to a five thousand dollar hydronic stove off the shelf so that's a good idea but that's just something in the background that we're working on uh, right here right now as we get ready for the tractor as well mm-hmm let's see so yeah so so do you have a Do you have I, a CAD link? Do you have a CAD? Um, I don't have. Oh yeah, I, I can show. Oh. Yeah, so I can pull it up on FreeCAD and uh, show it. But. Okay. Yeah, if you can upload that to your log, that would be great. Okay. Uh, so, so we've got some pieces of it already. Okay. Um. First comment, <clears throat> you got the, the vibration happening in a direction perpendicular to what's needed. 
uh, the vibration has to be back and forward. Right now you have it side to side. So uh, that's that's just one comment. This isn't okay. I'm I must have misunderstood with this motor model, but this isn't this isn't a rotary motor. No, no, no. A... It's no. It's all good. I'm just saying the orientation, uh, the way you so for so let, to explain it. If you have an eccentric weight on that motor, the force is going to be left and right in your picture. Uh, in other words, the lengthwise of the quick attach. What you need to do is mount that on the forward and back direction so that when the eccentric is rotating it's it's vibrating back and forward as opposed to side to side. Uh, so every, all the parts are correct I'm just saying you have to mount that motor 90 degrees to where you have from now. Um, like for example on this vertical face here uh, of this 4x4 tubing, that's where it would have to go in order for it to work. So, so details, yeah, yeah. Um, you can probably see in the trencher pictures that are online where, well, the motors are typically hidden, but you can infer that um, it's mounted on the side. But the point being that the, the eccentric, whichever yeah, whichever way the eccentric is pointing towards from the the shaft, that's the, going to be the direction of the motion, uh, direction okay. of the vibration. Yeah, so that's that's one thing to change there. Uh, but yeah, you've got the main pieces there. Um, I would I would still suggest the easiest way to do it instead of having the V shape. Um, yeah, I mean that works. Uh, it's two pieces of metal. The thing we have done before, which allows you to put a point on a, on a shank, is simply using a one-inch piece of metal with a pipe welded behind it. And the pipe would have to be kind of bent backwards to allow um, a little slight curve on the pipe to, to make it go backwards. What we want to do is probably, uh, probably want to come up with a concept drawing let's see we've done this let's see have we documented this before um, on the wiki we have uh, we have a we had a thing called the keyline plow or no oh man we, we did this um, trencher keyline plow let's see if I can pull it up to see what we've done what, what we did simply before was use a y but one by six inch shank of solid steel uh, so that's what we did before. What you have could also work to... Oh yeah, there you go. Uh, that's what we did. We have this machine built. We built this for the nut plant out. And it's one of those things that are completely um, undocumented here. We've got a lot of video from that. we got to put together a video. When we planted out 20 acres of the hazelnuts and chestnuts, we used this as the shank behind which we were planting the plants. So the shank basically ripped open the soil, and we're planting in that little furrow. But that's a similar okay. prim principle. This is not and vibratory. Yep. One inch thick pieces. Yeah, yeah. That's all it was. Um, okay. You know what? Um, <laughs> I'm thinking if you talk about minimal parts count design trencher, do that. Extend the shank upwards. Mount the motor on top of that except that the, the concept with the motor is you need to have two supporting bearings so yeah I gotta mount that somehow but I'm gonna paste that into the, the existing page um, so prior work cool. yeah um. yeah um. cool yeah I was just trying to minimize parts Mm -hmm. So yeah, I'll yeah. make sure we put that plane. Um, yeah, I mean, trying to use that standard tubing to. Yeah. Yeah, but that's that's a lot of stuff. So. Yeah, so I'll come up with a. I'll I'll do a concept drawing to see what, uh, based on what we've done before. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, the parts are there. You just need a motor. You need a pipe. You need a shank. The pipe wants to be curved backwards so that when the, when whatever you're sending through it is coming out, 
it won't snag on it won't have to do like a 90 degree turn it's a nice pull um, across like a 90 or a 45 degree uh, bend that would be best um, and then you've got the nice quick attach that we can mount the mount the structure too that's great we can attach that readily so it's good mm-hmm yeah. yeah 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 so very basic yeah, turn that motor um, I mean that kind of changes having that mounting like that plate it does. that I was thinking about mounting the motor and the rest of the assembly too yeah no it does you have to we have to re, re revisit that um, yeah yeah it does that's all right um, yeah so that would probably be I mean, it might make it simpler, but it would be nice if you could do it simple like what you have here, but uh, it's vibrating in the okay. wrong direction. So basically, Absolutely. you have to turn that 90 degrees. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and then, yeah, so we'll, we probably still want a removable blade, but yeah, I think that instead of having two blades or two pieces of metal or some angle iron, just have a flat piece um, and then just weld that directly to a pipe. Uh, piece of conduit or something. Yeah, like a one-inch pipe would probably do. Mm -hmm. Okay. And yep. Something. Yeah, like and we'd that. have to have it like you were talking about at the bottom. You want to notch out of it so it doesn't have to take a super sharp bend. Well, you actually want to bend it. You probably heat it with a torch and bend it slightly. It would be the best thing because you want to. You, you don't want to have any sharp corners. You can you can break your wire or it can kink. Oh. If okay. you say pull and too hard, it will just kink a 90 degree. You want to have it a, a smooth 90 degree turn, which is basically heat it and bend it. Probably heat it with a torch and bend it. Um, or pipe bender. I mean, pipe bender is the standard tool to do that. Um, yeah. For the eccentric weight, the simple suggestion would be use a five pound, do a five pound hammer. Little, uh, five pound eccentric so yeah I'll uh, I'll concept it out uh, later and um, can go with it okay as far as the meeting itself we're uh, getting towards the hour let's see what else do we have as far as any reports from um, other people uh, anything Oliver or anything we had a session of of KiCad learning which is gonna come online pretty soon we we had a basic tutorial on how to use KiCad on on Sunday when we during the workshop, so we're going to publish that pretty soon. Uh, but besides that, um, anything else? Okay, um, so let's talk about the work to do. So so the priorities. I mean, we're pretty much got ten days to go on the um, on the tractor workshop. So it's all out on the documentation there and and refining the designs uh, which means when we build this micro track we want to have a second power cube available that's basically a cutoff power cube which doesn't have the cooler system so you can make a very tiny one just hanging <clears throat> on the back of the back of the tractor here somewhere uh, that's one of the things uh, the design here of the tensioner is coming along uh, it's just about a lot of details. Um, let's see. I mean, what what else are the main things to do? A little bit of detail on where we are on the front. This pipe here could be just simply welded to this this tube. It's a two-inch pipe, two not not a pipe, a two-inch two-inch solid shaft to which the loader arm mounts. So we we probably want to cut off the end of the the cylinder and put two-inch a two-inch mounting on the end of the cylinder here. Uh, so little details. Uh, the hydraulics have to be done. Just a basic hydraulic diagram. Uh, maybe, yeah, yeah. Let's see. So who is um, so then who is available to do work on this? So we've got Roberto and Abe, and Josh is working on a trench or part. Um, I'm going to be working on this basically as much time as I get. I'll be working on this, but here. Look at these details. We've got the full quick quick attach. That's technically correct. That's really good. Yeah, I mean this is it's looking pretty pretty solid. Um, yeah, very nice to 
So if we use the tracks from last year, we have the tracks already. In this, in this micro track, the tracks are, I believe, nine inches wide. Are they? They're, yeah, they're about nine inches. Uh, and the, the tracks that we have last from last year are 10 inches, so maybe uh, we could probably make the 10 inches fit on the exact design here. It'll just be a little closer to the side. Um, it looks like an inch or so. Inch or a little more to the side here. Um, so maybe I'll communicate with everybody on on the next task. I think Roberta, are you are you working on um, what's your next task? I have no next task. Okay. So I then I have a question about the yeah. micro track. Yeah. Uh, I see that um, asked for uh, forty one in inches for the width. Yeah. Of the bike slab, but now it's is 42 inches yeah with so the added tracks oh oh with the with what it is currently mm -hmm. yeah yeah currently it's 40, 42 yeah so it, it has has to be reduced to 41 or is, is no i think as it is uh, i think 42 is acceptable at this point um yeah and the bucket is 42 Yes, yes. Yeah, 42. I think that one inch, uh, that's quite acceptable as far as what we have for that discrepancy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that's looking quite good. Uh, and we have the short bucket on this right now, correct? Yes. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, the so to, if you Roberto, if you continue on the work here, then let's see, let's see how you've done the uh, what's the structure looking like on the other side? Yeah, you have it exactly, pretty much exactly the same as on a big tractor, correct? Yeah. Yeah, I think that works. So the question there would be, how far up can it travel? We and we have. Um, of the distance basically between uh, the shaft and the, the upper part of this the structure here um, and what is that distance that we can travel up want to have make sure we have enough enough travel let's see what happened to my frame here frame yeah uh, we have just about four inches of tension travel here so that's not a lot question is is that four inches sufficient to tension the track properly uh, it's not bad we might need a little more what I would do here is reduce the vertical height of those since they're yeah let's reduce the height uh, give it another uh, the distance between this top here, that that distance there, which is four inches, we could cut that off. We already have like eight inches of ver of uh, the vertical tubing there. So as long as we have, yeah, cut it off right above where the motor mounts. So that that way we can raise this thing up higher. And what I would do here is just add. Um, let's see, the simplest way is to put a collar on this on this shaft. So put a collar, one collar on one side, one collar on the other side, where we have a bolt attached to it, attaching to the this plate here, um, so that we're pulling straight up on the structure. Uh, so add a threaded rod, what would have to happen there for tensioning you'd have to get under yeah you'd be, have to be tensioning from the other side in which case what we need to do here move this plate here this front plate move it to the other side of this top plate so that we can have access to that bolt underneath this this plate does that make sense Roberto yeah yep let's do that 
uh, so that we don't have to reach under the arms to do the tensioning because the power cube is in the way there. So do that. And that way, when you put a bolt through that, all you need to do is tension a nut from the underside of this plate and this entire structure will move up as the nut is pulling. So uh, my suggestion is simple clamps. So basically like we've got these, all these clamps like these ones that are holding the loader arms in place. Put one of those on this shaft here and just weld uh, an assembly. Uh, easiest thing would be to actually weld a nut, a one inch nut to it, screw the threaded rod in there and make it go down into the plate so that you can um, basically tension, uh, tighten a nut. And I'm wondering even if one, one, one nut, one, one tensioning rod is good enough. I think it would be. So I would say just go with one, since this distance here is pretty tight, it's only like 12 inches or so. I think one, one tensioning threaded rod here would be sufficient to pull this entire structure. As I said, the force of a one inch bolt, the clamping force on that is on the order of tens of thousands of pounds. So that's more than enough. Uh, so I believe that a single threaded rod would do that for the tensioning here. I think we can we can definitely do that. Given that the machine itself is only about 2,000 pounds total, uh, we will be fine with one tensioning rod here. So use the collar, a tensioning rod, move the plate, this plate to the other side of this, and we've got our tensioning mechanism. That works out really well. Um, let's see, if, the, if we put in the power cube, there, we just have to have enough space behind the power cube. Uh, where's my power? There it is. Um, there's the power cubage. Uh, all we need to do is have enough space. Let's see, let's remove this. Remove, um, yeah, have enough space behind there um, that we can put the clamp collar on. And I think, uh, yeah, right now we don't, uh, we have to, if we put a clamp collar on, what we can do is, is not even do a clamp collar. What we can do is just put uh, a tube without the clamp. So, so we put it on before we actually insert the shaft. And that would allow you not to even use the clamps, uh, the, yeah, the bolts for the clamps. Uh, that would be okay. Because if we're pulling straight up and down, you don't need to tension to, to there is no side to side motion on that that uh, tube that would be there. Uh, so we don't need the clamps on it. So let's just put a, a simple tube of th three inch inner diameter, half inch wall, and that's what's gonna pull the, uh, the structure. Very easy, yeah, pretty good. Yeah, I mean this is this is quite quite good. This is uh, pretty much some more details on this, but largely good to go. Uh, so then maybe I'll focus on uh, the big tractor. I'll dole out any parts to Ahmed and to to Abe, and then we'll see where Germain can contribute as well. So I think uh, any questions, Roberto, for what what you can do here. Um, yeah, I have a question for the motor um, attachment. Yeah. Uh, that plate is uh -huh. enough, or or yeah. It, so it, if you uh, another plate. Yeah. So if you do do that plate as such, what I would like to do is do a triangle piece. Uh, so a triangular piece that goes like this. Can you see my cursor going? Do you see my cursor? So a triangle uh, that yes. would, yeah. So a triangle that would be essentially this shape. So we take one square piece, cut it in half, and make those two triangles, one for each side, and that should be that should be pretty good. If that's half inch steel, um, we should be pretty good. We've got that whole weld of this entire length. That's a very strong thing. And to prevent it from moving back and forth, um, that gusset there would help. Now it definitely would not hurt to have that on the bottom. But if we do that, it just makes it harder to bolt on the motor. Um, maybe just keep it on top and we'll see if that's, that should be plenty. If not, we can readily add that during the build. Um, this is actually something where 
CAE analysis would be very useful. It's like, okay, if we're pulling something with up to, say, you know, 3,500 pounds, which is what each track does, how much would that plate bend when we have this whole weld and that gusset on top? How much would that bottom bend out? Uh, that's something we can tell from CAE. And Cedric is, by the way, working on that, on a tutorial on that. Um, but I think for now, let's do one, one reinforcement on the top, a triangle, triangular piece, which would be good. Okay. Uh, and I'm also noticing, so here, oh, there's an artifact. That plate is remaining in there. That's, that's not there anymore, right? Right. Mm-hmm. That's good. All right. Well, that's, that's pretty good. Um, uh, and, um, I guess what I can do, yeah. Okay. So these motors are not the identical ones that I have here. So what I'll do is I'll actually measure the exact motor that we have because it's quite similar to this, but I'll measure the exact dimensions because that's going to matter like exactly where we're going to have to weld it there. Uh, so I'll get those measurements and have somebody draw that up um, from the exact version because this is quite approximate. It looks good here and it's close, but we want to do the exact, uh, more exact dimensions including the location there's there's two of these uh, fittings there's also a third small fitting on it so we have to make sure that's uh, accessible wherever yeah yeah so after this yeah I mean we've got all of a lot of this the details that I can see missing is just the details now as far as how we route the hoses um, starting to look at okay if we have the power cube like this where are actually where are we actually running all the hoses so they can go to a control panel uh, that's going to be hanging off uh, somewhere here for the operator. So I think what's happening here is we were largely done with the mechanical parts and now we can get onto the hose routing and I gotta pretty much buy any of that stuff within the next couple of days. Uh, it takes about four days to ship it here. So the next few days I gotta get all the parts out for all the hydraulics and the fittings and hoses. Uh, so the other things are whenever the wherever the hydraulics fittings are, we got to make sure that they're not conflicting. So basically, uh, drawing in some of the details of all the outlet the outlets of the cylinders of the motors to make sure there is no conflict, and then starting to route the hoses. And we don't have any easy way to do the hoses within FreeCAD. Um, we can maybe draw diagrams of this because uh, the hoses are going to be curved and uh, it's probably easier to do diagrams where we kind of say okay this hose points this way and that way and um, do basically annotated screenshots out of FreeCAD. What if you if we use uh, colored cylinders like we we do with we, we did with the with the wiring diagrams? Yeah uh, so have them yeah, and there so have a few cylinders where they go out and then they bend. Yeah, we could do that. Or no, just the the cylinder uh, in the end and the start point. Uh huh. Okay. Yeah, we should do that. That that would be a great start on that. So we're clear about where the beginning and the end points of various hoses are. Yeah, and that would help us label the things within uh, if we take screenshots. Because if we do the build instructions, we yeah, we can take, for example, screenshots. We can show beginning point and end point, and then you say, okay, connect this hose from this beginning to end point. Uh, so we can have basic instructions on how to do that. Yeah, I think that sounds good. Mm-hmm. Excellent. All right, so what we'll do is uh, we'll be stripping a lot of these parts from the old machines, which is good, because that's going to make it easier. And... Uh, it's actually the rapid rapid prototyping. We're we're uh, reusing the parts as much as we can. Uh, for the tracks themselves, what we want to do is add, and um, I don't know if we want, necessarily want to do it here, but add a one inch, maybe like a quarter by one inch bar, like weld it to every, everyone. Because these tracks are flat, we want traction on them. So what we want to do is probably weld little uh, quarter inch by one inch bars on every end. That's what I would do so that we get extra traction. So you'd have, if these are, I believe, half inch on the current one, we would have a little um, tooth or little uh, cleat or, yeah, 
more traction so like a basically the whole length we would weld a quarter by one flat to the end of each track piece so that we have extra traction uh, that's the only other thing I, I don't know about putting that in the model we're gonna get really heavy in the model but uh, we should probably do that for the model as well that's um, I'm just concerned about the memory the size of this file getting too large mm-hmm yeah yeah really good I think this is this is good okay so Roberto we're good um, I'll talk to Abe and possibly Ahmed and and Germain and go from here any other questions or issues do we have any comments and questions for today questions and comments I think they've been explained okay all right well thank you very much then everybody uh, let's continue uh, I'll be in touch with everybody let's so in the background we'll work on the part naming convention and then uh, just catting up more of this tractor and getting parts getting that ready for this event which is going to be a nice one so uh, if anyone wants to join us on um, on a meeting for the automation part that's happening at 8 p.m. tonight on the same channel so thanks a lot and we'll talk to you next week again bye 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 bye